All right, we're going to talk about Mystery Babylon this morning. So turn to Revelation chapter 17. There's a lot of controversy over over the identity of Mystery Babylon. And we're going to go over the different possibilities and I'm going to show you proof positive that it's the Roman Catholic Church. I'm not going to lead up to it or, you know, try I'm going to tell you right up front it's the Roman Catholic Church and I'm Definitely not a fan of Roman Catholicism. So Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 through 6. We'll go down through that quick. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-collared beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Okay. Now there are basically five different possibilities for the identity <laughs> of this mystery Babylon. And of course there would be a sixth possibility and that's that would be the Catholic interpretation that it's just symbolic you know and that it's all the events of revelation took place in the past and now we're in this you know millennial something that millennial kingdom that's not really a thousand years you know <laughs> that's called all millennial belief and it's it's the teaching of the roman catholic church because they can't handle the bible okay and i'm sorry i'm going to be real blunt here but you're an idiot if you believe in all millennial teaching there's no nice way to put it Okay, the waters never turned to blood. There was never, you know, all the nations uh, being joined together in one nation with an Antichrist and everything else. That's nonsense. That stuff has not happened yet. You read through the book of Revelation, and most of it is not symbolic. Most of it is literal. I heard a statement the one time, uh, Revelation is not really hard to understand. It's just hard to believe. You know, and there's a lot of truth to that. You know, uh, the waters being turned to blood and all the living creatures dying. Is there anything at all symbolic about that? No. Is it hard to believe? Well, it's going to be, it's hard to imagine. I'll say that. I mean, you know, we live not too far, you know, down there across the road, there's a creek and up the road a little ways, there's a lake. I can't imagine that being blood, but it's going to happen. Why? Because the Bible says it's going to happen. Okay, but there are five things. We'll just throw out the amillennial thing. That's just nonsense. But then, then there there are five possibilities for the fulfillment of this city that's being spoken of there, uh, which is what it is, by the way. It's a city. Uh, number one, you have actual Babylon, geographic Babylon, which is in Iraq. Okay, that's the first possibility. That's possibility number one. Number two is Jerusalem, Israel. That's what a lot of the anti-Semitic people like Tex Mars, he teaches that. Okay, Mystery Babylon is Jerusalem. Number three, you have America. <laughs> That's another one I've heard. Actually, very popular. Um, number four, and there are some people that do teach this, that it's the Illuminati, uh, which I'll show you why they believe that, why they teach that. Uh, but that's another nonsense one. And then, of course, the fifth possibility, which is, I shouldn't say possibility because it's the truth, is is the Vatican City in Rome. Okay, that's your one there that it that that's definitely that one. Um, and I'm going to show you by the end of this study, you're going to be convinced that uh, it is Roman Catholicism that is described here. But now let's look at some points about this city, this mystery Babylon. Okay, first of all, she is symbolized as a woman. Nearly every verse down through there, verses 1 through 7, it's she, the woman which thou sawest, it's woman, okay? 
Now, of those five possibilities, how many of them are often called a woman? Only one of them. Is geographic Babylon called a, you know, in, in Iraq, is that called a woman? No. What about uh, Jerusalem? No. America? No. Well, they say Lady Liberty. Well, that's the Statue of Liberty. That, you know, but you don't really have America being called or symbolized as a woman. Okay, you have the Statue of Liberty, but that's not America. Uh, that's one place in America. Um, the Illuminati? <laughs> no. But what about Roman Catholicism? They call Roman Catholicism the Mother Church. You know? Yes, yeah, she's described as a woman. Okay, secondly, uh, Revelation 17, verse 18. Look there quick, it says, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Okay, now, what about the thing of a city? Is geographic Babylon in Iraq a city? Yes. What about Jerusalem? Yes. How about America? Is America a city? No. The Illuminati? <laughs> no. Uh, Vatican City? Yes. So, there you have that. Okay. Uh, let's just continue down through here. Uh, number three, the great city reigns over the kings of the earth. We just read about that there. Uh, does geographic Babylon and Iraq reign over the kings of the earth? <laughs> Hardly. What about Jerusalem? No. Some people try to say that it does. You know, they try to get, do this Zionism thing, you know, that the, the Jews control everything. That's nonsense. They don't. You have a lot of the Arabic nations over there that the Jews are not in control of them. And they want to wipe out Israel. So no, Jerusalem does not uh, rule the kings of the earth. Okay, America, do we control China or Russia? No. You know, all the time you see uh, Obama going over and he's bowing down to these kings and stuff. You know, he just met with the president of China here, I think just this past week, and he bowed to him. You know, we don't control the kings of the earth. Okay, what about the Illuminati? Well, yeah, you can make the case there that there's probably something to that. And the, the term Illuminati is kind of an elusive term because you have a lot of groups within this Illuminati structure um, and they aren't all specifically Illuminati, you know, but that's another study. Uh, what about Vatican City? Do they rule over the kings of the earth? Absolutely. It's weird to see every president has to go and bow before the Pope. I have pictures of all of them doing it. They're all going over there and meeting him, kissing his ring and stuff like that, bow, kneeling before him. Well, what's going on? I mean, if the Pope is just the head of a religious system, why are the, our presidents bowing to him? And all these other kings and things, why are they going and bowing to the Pope? Hmm. We'll get into that as we continue here too. So you see the first three there. Uh, symbolized as a woman, she's a city. Great city reigns over the kings of the earth. Roman Catholicism is the only one that, that uh, basically lines up with all three of those. But now point number four, uh, this city sits on seven mountains. Okay, verse nine, look at verse nine. And here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Okay, now... What about geographic Babylon in Iraq? Well, they claim that, yes, geographic Babylon does sit on seven mountains. What about, number two, Jerusalem? Well, they say that of Jerusalem, too. I can't prove all that, but I've heard it of Jerusalem. You know, what about America? Does America sit on seven mountains? <laughs> A city that sits on seven mountains? Hardly. No. Doesn't work. The Illuminati, does it sit on seven mountains? <laughs> <laughs> no, that doesn't work either. What about Vatican City? Yeah. Vatican City, is, is they call it about, there's actually a song. Uh, I have a video by Dave Hunt, and I don't agree with him on a lot of issues, but he did make a good video on Mystery Babylon, and he actually showed that there's a song that they sing over there about the city of Seven Hills or something like that. So, yes, the Vatican City does sit on seven mountains. 
does qualify for that. Okay, number five, her collars are purple and scarlet. Look at verse four. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Did you ever see a Catholic uh, prof processional or whatever that where the Pope's walking along over there in Vatican City? Gold, silver, pearls, just in abundance. I mean, carrying solid gold staffs and everything like that. <laughs> I mean, that right there should tip you off. Where's this stuff at in the Bible? Where do you see any of the disciples walking around with golden staffs and, and long flowing gowns and silk slippers? <laughs> you should watch out for any man that goes out in public in silk slippers, by the way. <laughs> um, but purple and scarlet. Look at a, a big gathering of cardinals and bishops sometimes. Sometimes, I mean, cardinals in red, bishops in purple. Okay, but let's get down through the list again. <coughs> Geographic Babylon. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Babylon and Iraq. Are their collars purple and scarlet? No. <coughs> Jerusalem. What are the collars of Jerusalem? Blue and white. <coughs> That's the color of their flag. America. Red, white, and blue. It's not purple and scarlet. We're not identified by that collar here. The Illuminati? <laughs> no. Uh, what about Vatican City? Purple and scarlet are the collars of Vatican City. You see it all over the place over there. Especially when there's big meetings of all the cardinals and bishops. That's their collars, purple and scarlet. I mean, it's right there. Okay, number six. She is drunk with the blood of the saints and martyrs of Jesus. Okay, what about geographic Babylon? Is uh, geographic Babylon guilty of shedding the blood of martyrs and saints of Jesus? Maybe a couple, but she's but definitely not drunk with the blood. Okay, not a huge number. What about Jerusalem? Yeah, a couple here and there, but certainly not to a, to the extent of the Roman Catholic Church. What about America? Yeah, right. <laughs> America hasn't shed the blood of the martyrs and saints of Jesus. <clears throat> the Illuminati? No. There again, not really. They haven't really killed that many Christians. Vatican City. What about Vatican City? <laughs> uh, a few, you know. I mean, it's. <clears throat> I've heard numbers from anywhere from 10 to 50 million uh, Christian martyrs down through the centuries, you know. It's certainly over 10 million. I don't know the actual number. Um, I don't think that you can know the actual number uh, because the ones that were keeping records of citizenship and everything, or you know how many people and census and all that, would have been the Catholic Church back through the Dark Ages. So, how many people are being killed? I don't think we'll ever know till we get to be with the Lord. Then we'll actually see the the martyrs there, you know. But it's millions and millions and millions have been killed by Roman Catholicism. And I'm going to show you a little bit later from one of their Bibles what they have to say about that. Okay, so <clears throat> of those six points, this mystery Babylon is a woman, she's a city, she reigns over the kings of the earth, she sits on seven mountains, her collars are purple and scarlet, and she's drunk with the blood of the saints and martyrs of Jesus. The only one that lines up with all six points is the Roman Catholic Church, Vatican City. The only one. All the other ones, you have to spiritualize things. You have to twist the scriptures to say things that they don't say. I mean, I, I read some of the arguments that America is Babylon, Mystery Babylon. And the guy was going to the Greek, of course, and well, the word here could actually mean this, and he was doing all kinds of contortions with the scriptures to prove that it was America. And these verses that talk about drunk with the blood of the saints and martyrs of Jesus, well, he was twisting that, and it doesn't really mean what it says. And nonsense. It's the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? But now I want to talk about here the, um, the claim that <clears throat> I actually heard Fritz Springmeier make the one time about that he believes that the um, Mystery Babylon is a reference to the Illuminati, 
Revelation chapter 18, verse 24. <clears throat> this is the verse he quoted. I'm going to show you why it doesn't work. It says, And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So he said, See now, the Roman Catholic Church only existed since about 300 or so A.D., approximately, of course. And so it can't be the Roman Catholic Church because they aren't guilty of all that were slain upon the earth. So it has to be the Illuminati. Well, you got a problem there because the Illuminati didn't show up till 1776. Okay. What's being talked about here is Babylon. Mystery Babylon. The Babylonian system. Okay. Now, if you went to some company that has been torturing people for 300 years and it was founded by Henry Smith and now Henry Smith Jr., 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 Jr. is running it. Do you charge him for the same or for all the crimes that Smith persecuting incorporated? <laughs> uh, do you charge him for all the crimes that they've ever done? Yeah. You see, it doesn't matter. Uh, <clears throat> it doesn't matter that they aren't the same necessarily as. Um, well, I'll say it this way: It doesn't matter that the Roman Catholic Church isn't necessarily the same as ancient Babylon in name and title. But they're still carrying out the same system of belief. So yes, it's part of, you know, Satan's church. Okay, Murder Incorporated will say. It goes back the whole way, back to ancient Babylon, and it comes up to today as the Roman Catholic Church. Now let's turn to Dan Daniel chapter 2, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. Daniel chapter 2, in your Old Testament there. <coughs> Excuse my voice here. <coughs> Daniel chapter 2, verse um, 31. <coughs> okay. Daniel 2, 31 says, Thou, O king, saw, sawest and behold a great image, this great image who, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The, this image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that the and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth okay this vision this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had had was basically a prophecy concerning this Babylonian system here you actually have geographic Babylon okay this is where it starts out at and it starts out with King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, but then there's going to come four kingdoms after his. Okay, and each one is going to be inferior to this image of gold here, the head of gold, which is where uh, King Nebuchadnezzar is basically at there. Okay, but I want you to notice something. Are these kingdoms separate in their time period? Yeah. But are they part of the same body? Yes. So you see, you could have the fifth kingdom being guilty of all the crimes of those other four kingdoms. Why? Because it's the same body. Yes, they're separate kingdoms. They're separate. You have basically Babylonian, Media Persian, or Media Persian, and then you have Greece, and then you have Rome, and then you have Roman Catholicism. Okay, you have that fifth kingdom. Okay, but they're all, they're separate, but they're all part of that same body. So, you have the fifth kingdom being guilty of the other four kingdoms' sins. That's what's going on there. But now look down to verse 40. It says, And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. There you have your Roman legions. 
And they were very tough. Verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Let's see, okay. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Okay, notice it says basically there that uh, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. Okay, it isn't post-millennial that uh, we're going to set up a kingdom here. We're going to bring in the kingdom and then Jesus shows up at the end and Christians will destroy the Antichrist and the false prophet in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh-uh. The God of heaven is going to destroy it. Read Revelation 19. Listen to the other studies. Jesus Christ is the only one who's going to defeat this system. Okay, that's why you can't be anything but pre-millennial if you're a Bible believer. All right, but... You see, the truth is, the Iron Kingdom, the Fourth Kingdom, does not completely go away. It changes, it transforms into the feet, which is part iron, part clay. Okay? It doesn't, it's not that the iron, you know, you see, when the gold goes away, it doesn't say, okay, now the gold is going to get mixed in with some of the silver, and then the silver gets mixed in with brass. Uh-uh. Each of those kingdoms disappears. The gold goes away, and it's no more gold. Now it becomes silver. Then the silver goes away. But you see with this iron, the iron doesn't completely go away. And you see, if you study history, you see back in the about 300, the 4th century, I'll say it that way, back in the 4th century, you see the Roman Empire basically crumbling. The Western Empire falls apart, goes away. But then the other part of the Roman Empire merges and changes into the Roman Catholic Church. All right? Um, but now I just want to look at something here. So you have the Roman aspect of this fifth kingdom, the iron. But what about this clay? What is clay a type of in the Bible? Go to Isaiah chapter 45. Go back a couple books bunch of chapters. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 9. Isaiah 45, verse 9 says, Woe unto him that striveth with his maker, let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou, or thy work he hath no hands? So what's clay a type of? Us. Our flesh. Turn to Romans chapter 9. I'll show you the verse that's very similar here. Romans chapter 9, verse 20. <clears throat> Verses 20 and 21, actually. Okay, Romans 9, verse 20. Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, what, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? So you see there that clay is a type of our flesh. And you don't really have a right to complain to God. Okay? You don't have a right to say, well, Why'd you make me this way? Well, you know, no, don't do that. So, but I just want to prove the point there that clay is a type in the Bible of our flesh. <clears throat> so, what do you have? You have this kingdom of iron and of clay. The iron is very clearly the Roman Empire. The clay is flesh. So that's your mixture there of the fifth kingdom. It's Roman and then flesh. And I'm going to 
show you a little bit more on that here in just a minute. Turn to Revelation, go back to Revelation chapter 17. I'm going to show you something interesting here. It's weird because a lot of times you'll see this thing of a lost person will actually make a statement totally ignorant of what the scripture says and they actually confirm the King James Bible by their statement and they don't even know it. And I'm going to read an article from a Catholic website here in just a, a minute or two. But it says, Revelation chapter 17 verse 1, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Okay, what are these waters? Verse 15, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the great whore sits upon many waters, and these waters are people. Okay, what are people? <laughs> They're flesh. So this woman, this Roman system, is going to have a lot of flesh under her control. And guess what? Guess which church is the biggest of all on this earth? Which church has the most members? Roman Catholicism. 1.1 billion members worldwide. The biggest of all churches. The second biggest is the uh, Islam, which is like 940 million. Okay? Uh, don't try to compete, by the way, if you're a Bible believer. <laughs> We're never going to be in the running for the biggest church. So, in spite of what some of the brethren try, you know, with their big church buildings, not going to work. But here I got on this website, fallibleblogma.com. <laughs> the guy's a Catholic, and he has a thing in here about, you know, there are about 1.1 billion Roman Catholics. Now listen to what he says here in this paragraph. And, I, you know, this guy, he couldn't turn to this verse, you know, to the Revel Revelation 17, verse 1 and 15. He couldn't turn to him to save his life probably. But he says here, So if you are ever unsure about the number of Catholics in the world or their influence, just remember that the Catholic Church is an ocean in a world full of ponds and puddles, just as we would hope Christ's church would be. So, in other words, if Jesus had a church, it would be the biggest one. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> uh, broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in there at. You know. But see, a Catholic looks at things through the flesh. And by the way, there in Revelation 17, I thought it was interesting. Verse 6, John says, And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. He didn't say astonishment or wonder. He said admiration. Why would John admire this woman that was drunk? In the same verse, she's drunk with the blood of the saints and martyrs of Jesus. Why would he admire her? Because she appears religious. That's why. And she's you know decked in gold and silver and everything else. Okay, so she is definitely appearing religious. And that's why a lot of people are deceived. Okay, now, <clears throat> turn to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to look at something here. Um, as I just stated, uh, the Roman Catholic Church is the biggest collection of flesh <laughs> on the planet. It's the biggest church. So let's talk about the flesh here quickly. Galatians 5, 19 through 21 gives the lusts of the flesh. Now, if the Catholic Church is the one most involved with the flesh, then these lusts of the flesh should be in abundance. <laughs> We're going to see that that's exactly true. So, let's look at how the Roman Catholic Church measures up to the lusts of the flesh. Number one, uh, verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery. Is there adultery in the Roman Catholic Church? Sure. Absolutely. And I want to read something here that's interesting. A lot of people aren't aware of this. Here I have the New St. Joseph Baltimore Catechism on page, uh, where are we at? 139 here. 139, it says, A Catholic who is married by a justice of the peace or a Protestant minister is really not married at all, but simply living in sin. 
If a Catholic is quote-unquote married in this way, it is hypocrisy and a mockery of God. God puts no bond of marriage around such a couple, as he does around couples who are married by a priest. When a Catholic is married at a civil or non-Catholic ceremony, other Catholics are not allowed to be present, or even to send gifts or show any approval, since this is not a real marriage, but simply a terrible agreement to live together in sin. If the marriage takes place at a religious ceremony, the Catholic party is excommunicated. To have this sin forgiven, the couple must be married by a priest or separate from each other. Now, I'm not going to keep reading here, but it goes on to say that if if you are a Catholic and you've been ignorant and you married a Protestant, you should immediately divorce them and leave them. Which is very interesting because 1 Corinthians seven twelve through 14 says, But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So the Catholic Catechism goes directly against the Scriptures. Okay? Which, you know, no big deal for the for the Catechism, because when you have a problem with the Scripture, well, you just throw in divine tradition. Okay? You make the Word of God of none effect by your traditions. See? This is the wicked church here. If you've been deceived into thinking that Catholicism is another branch of Christianity, uh, you better repent of that quick. <laughs> uh, they're not. Okay? This is the devil's church. So, there is certainly adultery in the Catholic Church. You have, you know, divorces, I'm sure, going on quite a bit. But then also, you actually have the Catholic Church teaching that you should leave, you should divorce on unscriptural grounds. Okay, so yes, there is adultery. Okay, what about number two there? Adultery, fornication. Is there fornication in the Catholic Church? Uh Probably one or two times a second. You know, yeah, there's plenty of fornication in the Catholic Church. Uh, this book here, <clears throat> I'm not going to read it for sake of time, uh, the thing about it, but this is a book of uh, 50 years in the Church of Rome. Very, very good book. Charles Chiniqui, I think is how you say that. Um, this is written back in the 1800s, the mid-1800s. This guy was a friend of Abraham Lincoln. Jack Chick has some good stuff on him. And he told of an example where a bishop came to him and did a confession to him. And he admitted that he had had over 75 acts of fornication with women, different women. 75 in the mid-1800s. All this uh, stuff that's going on right now, it's all over the news, all the pedophiles and all this, you know. Oh, what a shock. That's been going on for hundreds of years, thousands of years. Okay, and I, in the future here, I don't know if it'll be next week or not. I don't know if I'll have it done till then, but I want to talk about some of the doctrines and the teachings of Roman Catholicism. One of which being this thing of auricular confession. Okay, and that thing dates back to Babylon. And what you do is you take a single man and you tell him he's not allowed to get married. So the Bible commands there again, First Corinthians seven. It's better to marry than to burn. Okay, and if if you have a need there, it's perfectly fine and acceptable for you to get married. But the Catholic Church goes against that for a very simple reason, because it, it makes a system of blackmail. Okay, First you have the single priest that has no ability to take care of needs because he can't get married, and then you have him sitting in a confessional box, and he is required to ask about the personal, not only what a woman is doing, even if she's married, she has to tell him everything about her and her husband's intimate relationships. That's a fact. But she also has to tell him her thoughts. Everything has to be confessed or her sins cannot be forgiven. So here you got this single priest in there and he's not saved, so the Holy Spirit's not even there to help him. And now he's got to listen to all this stuff coming from these people who aren't saved either. Well, it's a recipe for disaster. And that's the intent, because once you get people who are compromised, 
who are doing things that are sinful and wicked, then you can hold that over them and say, you're going to do what I tell you to do, or I'm going to reveal this stuff. See? And it's getting to such a point now where so many little kids are being just molested, and I mean, it's a terrible thing. Now they're starting to come out and actually admit to what's going on. And you have Catholics right now that will defend everything that the Catholic Church is doing. Okay? They are that wicked and that brainwashed that they will defend what Roman Catholicism is doing. The Pope could go into their family and rape the wife and molest the kids right in front of them and they'd still defend him. See? And you tell me that that's another branch of Christianity? Nonsense. No. That's Satanism. All right? That is the devil's church. But let's continue on here. Galatians chapter 5, you have adultery, fornication, uncleanness. <laughs> Well, I don't think uh, we need to <laughs> show any examples of that. There's plenty of uncleanness in the Catholic Church. Lasciviousness. Now, what is lasciviousness? That means, if you look it up in Webster's 1828 dictionary, it says, looseness, irregular indulgence of animal desires, wantonness, lustfulness. Okay? Now, not only do you have, I want to say this too, not only do you have that among the Catholic clergy, the priests and things. Not only are they lascivious, but you also have it among the Catholic people. The Catholic people are very much, you know, partiers, drunkards, everything else. Um, okay, let's continue here. Idolatry <laughs> is the next one. No, 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 not, not the Catholic Church. There's no idolatry in the Catholic Church. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. Uh, they're the ones that have more idols basically than anybody other than maybe the Hindus. Okay, but there again, you see the Catholic Pope going and meeting with the leaders of, of Hinduism. You know, I've seen a picture of a, of a priest of Shiva or something, this woman coming up and, and giving the mark of Shiva on the forehead of the Pope, Pope John Paul II. I have a picture like that in my files. You know, they're all the same crew. That's the whole thing. It's kind of funny, too, because, you know, I, I know a, a radical pre-Vatican II Catholic, and, and they try to stick by the old ways of Catholicism and everything. They don't go along with the ecumenical movement. Well, you have to understand that the Catholic Church is about getting control of all the flesh out there. They don't care about loyalty to Jesus Christ. Not at all. That's what they portray to the people. But there was actually one of the popes, I don't, I don't remember which one it was, but he said how profitable the fable of Christ has been to us. See, that's the true philosophy of Catholicism. They're in it for the money. They're in it for the control. They're not worshipers of Jesus Christ. They only use the terminology to, terminology to deceive people. But let's continue here. Okay, you have verse 20 there. Idolatry, witchcraft. What about witchcraft? All of the Catholic Church wouldn't be involved in that, would they? Well, actually, if you look at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, there's a, a thing in, in witchcraft called the Eightfold Path of Enlightenment. It's a circle, and it has eight spokes, so to speak, in it. Now, the biggest one of those in the world is St. Peter's Basilica. It's the biggest Eightfold Path of Enlightenment. And uh, back through the Dark Ages, they would kill witches a lot of times, and people say, well, see, then they're not for witchcraft. No, that was just eliminating competition. <laughs> is what it was okay Roman Catholicism is very much friendly with witchcraft all right uh, number seven here hatred what about hatred well ask a Catholic a really fanatical one sometime you know what do you think about Martin Luther or Oliver Cromwell or uh, some Protestants <laughs> you get to see hatred firsthand but in case you don't believe, you know, in Catholic hatred of, of real Christians, I want to go here. This is, I have here an original reprint of a 1610 Jesuit Dewey Reims Bible. So we're going to go back. I was doing some research here and I found this and I just couldn't believe it. Their footnotes on uh, Revelation chapter 17. And it says here, the Protestants foolishly expound it to Rome. Speaking of the blood of the martyrs and saints of Jesus, they were trying. They're saying they're trying to refute the thing of the Protestants saying 
you people are killing Christians. Okay, and this is written back in 1610. So this is back when they were still killing Christians. But it says, The Protestants foolishly expounded to Rome for that they, for that there they put heretics to death and allow of their punishment in other countries. But their blood is not called the blood of saints, no more than the blood of thieves, man-killers, and other malefactors, for the shedding of which, by order of justice, no commonwealth shall answer. Think of that. In other words, you want to kill a Protestant? Well, it's the same as killing a thief or a murderer or whatever. Just kill them. You won't have to answer for it. That's what they're teaching. And here's a little note here. It says, putting heretics to death is not to shed the blood of saints. So if you're a heretic, according to Roman Catholicism, you can be killed. No problem. Okay. And they still have those beliefs today. You know, the Vatican II thing with all the ecumenical nonsense was just a smokescreen to draw in a bunch of stupid professing Christians that, oh, we trust Roman Catholicism now. They're not bad anymore. <laughs> yes, they are. Okay. Um, let's continue on here. And uh, by the way, I just want to say, too, it's perfectly fine and acceptable to hate Roman Catholicism, but we have to be careful that that hatred does not spill over onto the Catholics. Okay, there are some Catholics that you could probably hate, you know, because they're not going to change, they're not, you know, they're fanatics. But there are a lot of them that are just ignorant. And right now, by the way, is a very good time to witness to Catholics because a lot of them are very disillusioned. They're starting to question. They're saying, if this is the one true church, then why are why do the priests molest children? I don't want my kids being molested. And they're starting to kind of scratch their heads. See, we should not have hatred for those people. They're in it innocently, ignorantly. That's why they're in it. But as far as hating evil, I just want to read uh, two verses here. Romans 12, 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. And that's kind of referring back to Amos chapter 5, verse 15. The first part of it says... Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. So yes, you should hate evil. You see, true love requires true hatred. But, as I said, don't let that hatred spill over onto the Catholic people themselves. Okay, number eight. You see there in verse 20. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance. Okay, now what is variance? Variance is difference that produces dispute or controversy, dissension, discord. Um, do the differences between us and Catholics produce dissension and discord? Of course, yeah. Okay, and of course they're not going to submit to the teachings of the Bible and uh, repent and change. And we can't change our stands either. So yes, there is a lot of variance within the Catholic Church. But what about the next one there? Emulations. How do you define emulation? Well, I'm going to read here Webster's 1828 dictionary definition says, The act of attempting to equal or excel in qualities or actions, rivalry, desire of superiority attended with effort to attain it, attain to it, generally in a good sense or an attempt to equal or excel otherwise in that which is praiseworthy without the desire of depressing others. Okay, there's that's it can be good, but it says in a bad sense, a striving to equal or do more than others to obtain carnal favors or honors. Uh, is the Pope on the same level as the Catholic on the street? No, <laughs> they worship the Pope as God. So, is there emulation within the Catholic Church? Yes, certainly. All right, what about? The next one there, we have emulations, wrath. Uh, well, what about wrath? <clears throat> I'm going to read here a little bit of the Jesuit extreme oath of induction. Uh, the Jesuits were started in the mid-1500s to counter the Reformation, okay, to bring all churches back under the control of Rome. And by the way, we are in the final stages of that, where all the big denominations are now under Roman Catholic control. That's why you shouldn't be part of a denomination, by the way. That's why we call ourselves Bible believers. 
I mean, our our doctrines are basically Baptist, you know, and we agree with the Baptist denomination in most issues, but we aren't going to call ourselves Baptist because we don't want to be linked to a denomination. You know, it's not a sin necessarily, but we just, we are Bible believers. That's what we are. Okay? But I just want to read here a little bit of the extreme oath of induction. This is what a Jesuit swears to when they are initiated into the higher realms and when they go out to actually deceive Protestants. They say, um, the superior actually says to the Jesuit that's there to be trained, he says, you have been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between communities, provinces, states that were at peace and incite them to deeds of blood involving them in war with each other and to create revolutions and civil wars in countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and the sciences and enjoying the blessings of peace. Roman Catholicism does not want people getting along and having peace. Okay? They don't want that. They incite wrath and hatred. Okay? What about strife? The next one. Well, I'm going to read further down here in the extreme oath of induction for the Jesuits. It says, I furthermore promise, this is what a Jesuit has to swear, I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity present, make and wage relentless war secretly or openly against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the walls, in order to annihilate forever their execrable race, that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poison cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the poignard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus. Good Christian love there, brother. I'll tell you what. <laughs> you know, you can just feel the love, you know, if <laughs> you read through it. But you see, that's what they do. Okay, you talk about strife. They're saying, don't let anybody get along. Kill them if you can, assassinate them, murder them. And that's what the Jesuits have done. And their killing and murdering here in America has been mostly through the Bible colleges. They've killed and murdered Christians, faith in the King James Bible. And they're getting Christians to, to think, think well of the Catholic Church, which is just disgusting. Okay, let's continue on here. Seditions is the next one. Okay, a sedition is a rebellious uprising against authority. Well, obviously the Jesuits there. Um, and, you know, people say, you ask the average modern-day fundamentalist Christian, what are you worried most about? All oh, those Islamic terrorists, Al-Qaeda and stuff like this. <laughs> I'm not worried about them. Islam does not scare me one bit, to be honest with you. I'm not really worried about Islam. The Jesuits, yeah. The Jesuits are a much more serious threat. And you can see their influence in the churches because 99% of Christians don't even think about them. They see, they drive past a Jesuit university, you say, hey, what's that? There's a Jesuit center. What do you think of that? Oh, I don't know. Hey, there's a guy that's Islamic. <gasps> we should call Homeland Security. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Okay. Uh, let's continue on here. Number 13, we have heresies. <laughs> Are there heresies within the Catholic Church? Yeah, there's a, a few, you know, here and there. Like I said, I'm going to do another follow-up message to this one where I actually go into transubstantiation and the confessional and nuns and monks and all this other stuff. I'm going to show you that that stuff is heresy. But let's go to verse 21, envyings. A Catholic... Uh, does not have joy, they don't have peace, they don't have hope. Uh, a true Catholic is taught that you have to work all of your life, and if you die in a state of grace, you might not have to spend as much time in purgatory. I mean, the best of the best Catholics 
believe that when they die they're going to burn. I mean, think about that. Do they envy a Christian? Do they envy a Bible believer? Yeah. They'll get mad, you know, all these Protestants. They say that they know that they are going to heaven. They say that they can know it. That's ridiculous. You know. Yeah, they envy the peace that a Bible-believing Christian has. So yes, there is envying there. Uh, let's look at the next one. Murders. <laughs> a few. Cup in the, up into the uh, couple of million there. Drunkenness. Um, they drink wine for communion. <laughs> of course there's drunkenness. And there again, Charles Janicki's book, 50 Years in the Church of Rome, he talked about going different places to see bishops or different dioceses, and, and he would go in and he would walk right in on a drunken, all the priests are sitting around drunk. And that's back in the 1800s. So, yeah, I'm sure there's quite a bit of drunkenness and uh, wickedness in the Catholic Church today as well. And, of course, the Catholic people a lot of times are drunks. Um, oh, and I do want to say one other thing. Uh, John Ronald Rule Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis um, were both... C.S. Lewis was supposed to be an Anglican or something. He was a Catholic. Okay, He believed that he was going to purgatory when he died. <clears throat> His books have uh, turned a lot of Catholics back to their faith. I mean, both men were members of the Order of the Golden Dawn, there, which is a very high-level occult uh, organization. They were both occultists. Okay? They wanted to make paganism sound Christian, which is the job of the Catholic Church. Tolkien was a radical Roman Catholic. He told his son the one time, I did a lot of research into both these men, that's why I'm talking about them, but Tolkien told his one son that the only thing that you can really truly love on this earth is the Blessed Sacrament the Eucharist. Not Jesus Christ. Of course, to a Catholic, the Eucharist is Jesus Christ, uh, which is heretical nonsense. But Tolkien and C.S. Lewis were tra taking paganism and trying to make it Christian, okay, which you can't do. And uh, the, where did they meet? The Inklings was their group, and they met with a lot of the other big scholars and you know guys like that. They met in pubs. The Inklings met at uh, the Bird and Baby, I think, was the one that they met at, and, and then they met at another place. But they're reading Tolkien's letters to family members or to different people. He was talking about alcohol the whole time, you know, and saying about how his wife was complaining because his barrel of beer behind the kitchen, you know, it, it was leaking all the time, and, and it's it smelled of beer in the house all the time like that, you know. These guys just drank all the time. And Tolkien, when he got up in years, he was complaining because his doctor told him he couldn't drink for a little while. These guys were drunkards. Big time. There are stories of where Tolkien went into the bird and baby into the pub and C.S. Lewis being drunk and being obnoxious and everything. So don't fall for the, the Chronicles of Narnia or the Lord of the Rings thing. It's purely pagan wish I could say a lot more on that, but that would take me in another direction. But let's look at the last one here, revelings. Okay, what is a reveling? Well, it's basically partying. Wild, insane partying. And I have here a book by a demented pagan named Brian McLaren. He's one of the leaders of the uh, emergent church. And I have him in my new video. This book, actually, it says... Uh, why I am a missional, evangelical, post-Protestant. And he goes on to say, Catholic, unfinished Christian. Guy's warped. He has a whole bunch of things here. But I want to just read something he says about the Catholics, why he's a Catholic. Uh, reason, he has a bunch of reasons here. And he says, uh, Catholics know how to party. <laughs> That's one of his reasons why he calls himself a Catholic, because they know how to party. He says, but on the other hand, can you imagine Lutherans or Presbyterians or Baptists creating Mardi Gras? No, I can't. <laughs> but, you know, this this is a good thing. Mardi Gras is a good thing, you know, created by Catholics. So, <laughs> whatever. Don't fall for the emergent church movement. It's very, very wicked of the devil. Uh, but <clears throat> let's continue on here. Notice there in verse 21 it says, 
of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All of those things, all of those wicked lusts of the flesh, are in abundance within the Catholic Church. It's not another form of Christianity. But now let's go back to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, verse 41. It says there, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so shall the kingdom be partly strong and partly broken. Now I'm going to offer up a theory here, which kind of came to me as I was doing this message. And it's just a theory. I'm not going to be teach this doctrinally and be dogmatic about it. But it's something that I think is very interesting. People say there have been four kingdoms and the fifth one is coming. Well, here's my theory. What if we're in the fifth kingdom? What if we've been in the fifth kingdom since the fourth century? Has there ever really been a break in the Roman Catholic Church controlling things? Well, somewhat. I mean, they pretty much controlled everything with an iron fist, literally iron, <laughs> up until the Protestant Reformation. But since then, have they lost complete control? Absolutely not. Who really is running things right now? I would say Rome. I mean, you know, all oh, America is doing things and we're going out and imperialism and all this. Other. Yeah, <laughs> but our president bows to the Pope. And the Pope says, I want you to do this and I want you to do that, you know. I think Roman Catholicism is still calling the shots. So, like I said, I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, but I do believe that there's a possibility that we are in that fifth kingdom and that doesn't mean that we're in the tribulation or anything no it just means that the fifth kingdom is there and ruling things but the full manifestation of that kingdom is going to be in the tribulation okay but i don't think that that kingdom is just going to last for seven years i think that it's been here since about the fourth century i just wanted to say that but by the way i just want to say something else here i want to make another point uh, before we continue on here uh, the word Catholic. What is the word Catholic? Well, there's a Greek word, Catholicos, or something like this. And that's what, there was an early church father, and he used the term. So now this thing has been taught now for a long time that the early Christians called themselves Catholic. All because one church father said Catholicos, used a Greek word. So then all, all the early Christians called themselves Catholic. Well, no, I don't believe that. I don't believe that for one minute and you can see this thing being taught in our bible colleges today i believe it's because of jesuit influence okay you have early christian groups like the waldensians and the albigensians the donatists the Paulicians. there's no record of those people all ever calling themselves catholic okay it's not a bible word well what's what's it mean it means universal okay now think of the true meaning of the word universal does the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, are they trying to bring all religions together? Yeah. They are the universal church. Okay? Universal. The ones that control the most flesh. So now think about this, the feet there. Part iron, part clay. Roman Catholic. I mean, it works out perfectly. Universal. The majority of people. There's your clay. So you have Roman Catholic. I mean, it's right there. The iron, the clay. Roman Catholic. So, you know, is the fifth kingdom here? Yeah, I think it is. Okay, and, it, and now it's going to be fully manifest in the future. They are taking over. But I want to show you something else which is interesting here very quickly. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. 
he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And it goes on to say about that he made a decree that whenever the rock band started playing, that everybody was to bow down and worship it. <laughs> I mean, you look at the instruments that are listed there, by the way, that was probably a pretty, you know, rocky sounding music that was being played. But the point is there, what is this image? Now, you ask the average Christian, they're going to tell you it's a statue of Nebuchadnezzar. But my contention is, it's not a statue. Nowhere in Daniel chapter 3, you look down through the whole thing, we're not going to go over it, but you, you read Daniel chapter 3 sometime and show me any place where it says the statue of gold. It doesn't. It says the image of gold. Okay? It never says statue. And look at the measurements of this thing. You have... The height is three score cubits. What's a score in the Bible? Twenty. So three score is sixty. Okay? Sixty. And the breadth thereof, six cubits. That was a little, little bit of gold there. <laughs> Essentially, a cubit, if you work it out, you're talking about approximately 8.7 feet in diameter at the base and 87.45 feet high. So basically, nine, we'll round it off to make it easy. Nine feet wide, 90 feet high. Now, figure that thing out. Would it make sense to have a statue of a man that is ten times the height as it is, as it is wide? No. That's not the scale that you would make a man to. And you could say, well, there was a base and then the guy up on top. Eh, I don't know about that. And not only that, but you make a statue that's that high, an image, I should say, I'm sorry, an image that's that high, you get a major wind coming up. I mean, here, I'll, I'll stand, you know, I'm wider up here than I am down at my feet. Well, guess what happens? You have an, a, an image, a, a statue, if it was a statue of Nebuchadnezzar, that thing couldn't take the wind. And if it's out in the plains, it's, there's no trees to, to shield the wind from it. Okay, do we have any statues here in America, any images that are very tall and very narrow? Washington, D.C. Yeah, what is it? What in, in Washington, D.C., what do we have? The Washington Monument. It's an obelisk, okay? I believe that that's what the image was. It doesn't say statue, it says image. And... I can't really get into what the image of an obelisk means, but I'll just say it this way without trying to be crude. It is a male phallic symbol, an uncircumcised male phallic symbol. I'll say it that way. If you need to know more, email me. I, I'm not going to go into it. But the ancient worshippers of Baal worshipped the male phallic symbol. Okay, That's why they've always had They've always been perverts because that is the center of their worship structure. Okay? And that's why the Hebrews, for them to bow, bow down to an uncircumcised image, would have been absolute, totally out of the question. It would have been blasphemy. Okay? It would have been bad enough bowing down to a man, but bowing down to a phallic symbol like that, no way. They wouldn't have done it. You know, I'm not going to bow down to something like that. Okay, but this symbol has been around for thousands of years. And you know what's interesting about it? Take a look at St. Peter's Basilica sometime. Right in the center of the Eightfold Path of Enlightenment, right in the center of it, is an a phallic, or a uh, obelisk, excuse me, an obelisk from Egypt. And I actually asked some Catholics one time online, we were back and forth, and I asked them, I said, why would the Pope, if the Pope is a Christian, why would he ship a, an obelisk, a known occult symbol, why would he ship it from Egypt, an ancient Egyptian obelisk? What's going on there? No answer. <laughs> How could you answer it? I mean, can't they make one there in Rome? You know? Why ship one from Egypt? doesn't make any sense. Unless it's that long line of Babylonian pagans, the priests of Baal, which is what a Catholic really truly is. But you see, there again, 
you have the image of Baal, you have this image of gold being set up by Nebuchadnezzar, and the fifth kingdom sets up the same image, right in the middle of where all those people gather. You look at pictures of the Easter celebration, people covering that whole area, all around the obelisk. Okay? It's right there. It's right in front of you. Ancient Babylon is not gone and no more. It's alive and well today in the Roman Catholic Church. They are Mystery Babylon. I mean, you, you, you can't make a case for any of the other ones. It's not America. It's not Jerusalem. It's not Iraq. You know, it's not the Illuminati. It's Roman Catholicism. It's plain and simple. Uh, <clears throat> and, of course, two good books here. Obviously, can't go over these, but uh, three good books. Did the Catholic Church Give Us the Bible by David Dan uh, W. Daniels? Chick Publications. Very good. But then these are the two definitive works on it. You have here uh, Babylon Religion, How a Babylonian Goddess Became the Virgin Mary by David Daniels. Chick Publications. It proves everything that I'm saying right now. And then the real scholarly work by Alexander Hislop, The Two Babylons, which is another great work on the whole Babylonian thing. <clears throat> okay, now let's finish up here. A couple more places to turn to. Okay, but I just want to say, turn to Revelation 16 while we're turning there. Um, you say, well, why would God blame today's Roman Catholic Church for all the righteous blood ever shed? And I think I kind of covered that already because they are the same ancient Babylonian worshippers of Baal. And a lot of that stuff is for more for private study. I can't get into too much of it here. But Revelation chapter 16, verse 19. People say, well, shouldn't we just forgive and forget the sins of Rome's past? You know, should we hold it against them or should we just forgive and forget? Well, Revelation 16, verse 19 says, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And look at this. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. You know, you say, well, that's horrible. Why would, why would a loving God do that? Let me tell you something. Loving God right there has let them go on about their wickedness for thousands of years now. And has not stopped them. His love is going to come to an end though at some point for them. And he's, his long suffering I'll say. His long suffering nature is eventually going to come to an end. This has not happened yet. And that's why the Roman Catholic Church they try to, to allegorize and spiritualize the book of Revelation. And in fact Vaticanus, one of the Roman Catholic Church's manuscripts, omits the whole book of Revelation. <laughs> they just get rid of it. That's why the Roman Catholics can't handle the book of Revelation because their destruction is prophesied and it's coming. Uh, turn over to Revelation 18. And while you're turning there, probably don't have to turn very far. I just want to say something here, this thing about forgiving and forgetting. You say, well, God's not going to forgive and forget. So what should a Christian do? Well, I have here a couple of articles. Here you have one on uh, Jerry Falwell when he died. And it says, He put aside generations of anti-Catholic prejudice to form a close working relationship with conservative Catholics. That's what you call a traitor. And then the other one here, I'll read this real quick. Um, here when John McCain was running, you had John Hagee that uh, basically some of the Catholics were getting upset about because John Hagee used to identify Mystery Babylon as Roman Catholicism. But here Hagee writes, uh, quote, out of a desire to advance a greater unity among Catholics and evangelicals in promoting the common good, I want to express my deep regret for any comments that Catholics have found hurtful. Both men are traitors. Whether or not they were saved, I'm not going to say, but both of them are cowardly traitors and by the grace of God I will never ever back down from calling Roman Catholicism mystery Babylon but now let's read here let's finish up Revelation 18 verses 1 through 11 
It says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even, even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, and death, mourning, death and mourning, and famine, and she shall utterly be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. All right. The Bible very clearly teaches there that it's not only is she going to be wiped out, Roman Catholicism, in one day, but it's actually going to be one hour. Now let's read here Revelation chapter 18. And we're going to go to uh, now we'll actually we'll go to Revelation chapter 19 after um, Roman Catholicism is wiped out. This is what happens. Revelation 19 verse 1 says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, judgments for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they, and again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. We're going to have a party and a celebration in heaven when we see the Roman Catholicism being destroyed. I'm looking forward to that. And I'm, you know, I, I'm not a martyr. I haven't lost any family members to Mystery Babylon, to Roman Catholicism. But, uh, I shouldn't say that. I should say I haven't lost any of my fleshly family to them. But I have lost spiritual members of my family to that system. And it's going to be a glorious day when they are finally destroyed. But I just want to read one other thing here. Um, just a man who had a lot of good sense. Uh, one of my heroes is Oliver Cromwell. Uh, God raised him up shortly after the Protestant Reformation, and actually right after the King James Version was completed, God raised up Oliver Cromwell as a great military hero to fight against Roman Catholicism and and take away their physical, political power. And he, he kicked them out of countries. He'd go in and he'd send warning, I'm coming, get out. He did that in Ireland. He did it in Scotland, a couple nations, and they were scared to death of the guy. Oliver Cromwell, when he was in command, never lost one battle. Not one. He was a great military hero. And by the way, while he was out there fighting, he was sick. He struggled with sickness all of his life. He was a, just an amazing man um, and definitely saved. There's no question about that. But here he says, see, there was a big thing back then. Well, shouldn't we reform the Catholic Church? Maybe we could help them and change some of their corrupt ways and whatever. And Oliver Cromwell knew the scriptures. And he says, Whosoever would have gone about to heal Babylon when God was determined to destroy her, he does fight against God because God will not have her healed. And that's it. Right there. God's not going to fix the Roman Catholic Church. Why? Because he's already written it. It's already in ink right here. It's going to be destroyed. 
Roman Catholicism's death warrant is already signed. And But right now, like I said earlier, right now we have an opportunity with a lot of Catholics starting to doubt the Catholic Church because of all the abuse stuff going on. Right now is a great opportunity to witness to them and get them out of that system okay, before it's too late. But do not ever, you yourself, don't ever fall for Roman Catholic lies. Don't ever try to unify with them. Don't ever try to come to a place of common consent. Don't ever do it. And number two, if you have a pastor or a leader of any kind and they're friendly to the Roman Catholic Church, get away from them. Get as far away from as, them as you can. I don't care how quote-unquote godly they are or spiritual they are. If they say that the Roman Catholic Church is okay and don't talk about the crimes of the past and don't talk about the Jesuits, they are crooked. They're corrupt. So I guess that's it for this morning. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.